Hi folks, my name is Mike Hittner and I play the character Robert Wakeley. This is the Wakeley home and this is at Point Boss. A little bit about Robert Wakeley, he was born in upstate New York around the Lake George area and him and his father Thomas were in the lumber business but uh, this area had been settled for about 150 years previously and so there wasn't a lot of opportunity to be, to be made there anymore and he was the typical Yankee entrepreneur and so he heard about the great white pine forest in Wisconsin from some people that had visited and so he decided to come. So he took his wealth in a raft of lumber down the Allegheny and down the Ohio River to Cincinnati. He sold it in Cincinnati and he stayed the winter in Cincinnati and took a steamboat to St. Louis. And coming up from St. Louis he came up to the Wisconsin River and then from Portage, Wisconsin on he was pulled up the river and we're going upstream to uh, Point Boss going north and so he pulled up the river to this point and he stopped at this point on the river because the last rapids on the Wisconsin River is here at Point Boss. So the importance of it is, is at any point from this point onward, if you're going north, you had to portage around those rapids where we have our, our power plants and our paper mills today. In the Wakeley's day, this was kind of a spot that the Native Americans crossed for 200 years. The Native Americans crossed east and west here, and that's where the French term Point Boss, which means low spot or low water, came to be and so it was a natural intersection as we see businesses built today they're built on intersections and this was an intersection the Wakeley's day the main transportation up and down the river was our north-south transportation and east and west across at this crossing point the best spot in 30 or 40 miles north or south could cross by pony or by foot on in low water Robert Wakeley was also very instrumental in the in the communities here he met George Stevens and Stephen in St. Louis told him about the great white pine forest, helped him to establish his mills at Big Bull and Little Bull Falls, today Merrill and Wausau. And that's uh, Stevens Point is named after him to this day, named after George Stevens. He was also a judge of elections, a first postmaster for Point Boss from 1845 to 1850. And uh, unfortunately, the community didn't grow like it was supposed to. And so he lost that uh, postmastership and the post office but this was a thriving, growing community at one time. And then today, instead of visiting Point Boss, we might have been visiting Nakusa if the railroad had, had been, uh, uh, went on the east side of the river and also if the water power had been harnessed by the Wakeleys. Good day to everybody there in TV land. This is Mike Hidner, Historic Point Boss Update with Tom Bramer, a guest. And we're back in the studio now, so a little different for you now. And we're back here talking about Sugarbush, Tom. Uh, you were out at the uh, Trader's Cabin, of mm -hmm. course, and uh, give us your perspective from where you were at. Well, I think we had a really good day. Uh, it was... Um a little spotty, but that's normal. Uh, you get a lot of people and then there's a little lull and then you get some more. But uh, I thought we did really well. The weather was certainly cooperative. And how did your fritters work out? Um, <laughs> well, okay. Uh, we had a couple of glitches, but uh, I think actually historically they turned out better than I had planned for them to. So yeah. I, the, the I, one I had when I visited you was very good. I mean, that was in the middle maybe of when you were making yeah. them. So. It might have been a little rough on the beginning and maybe at the end, but the in-between, it seemed like right. you... It seemed good. to work out real well. Temperature is a hard thing to do. I've um, already been working on stuff for next year. Mm -hmm. um, some of it with the maple syrup, maple sugar working, and some of it with uh, what we want to do. Yeah, I, I think what we're talking about, at least we had talked about it, uh, I think on Monday or something, was to take the primitive and put it all by the mm -hmm. trader's cabin because that's probably where it would have mm -hmm. transpired and and then the regular cooking that uh, Jim did uh, to be had right, right. behind the three bay right. shed where we did it this year. I, I think it'll be easier to interpret and easier to understand mm -hmm. if we separate the two and we can be more detailed and I've got some um, in fact this morning I ran across some things from the Zabwing um, uh, Ojibwe Center in Michigan where we visited uh, last fall um, some stuff on finishing maple syrup yeah. uh, that I think is going to work out real well for us. And that was our, our bigger issue of how do we get it from syrup to sugar right? so people can see the process. Yeah. Now unlike uh, Tom who was at the trader's cabin I was 
I was at the school for the morning because we were missing a school marm, and so I was over there. But it was a very nice turnout. Lots of little tykes. I mean, uh, kindergartners, first, second, third graders with grandparents, and there was one Cub Scout group out, and and a very nice flow of people early. I'd say 10:30 they were coming in. And I was working with them, and of course I don't do a lot of the schoolhouse, so I had them drawing pictures and writing their name and, and some of that sort of recitation sort of things that uh, that a teacher would have done, though I'm not trained really in the schoolhouse sort of thing. Went to the uh, uh, the Wakeley House afterwards, and uh, went very well in there. The pancakes were well received. Uh, we had a little problem, a little glitch about 2.30 or so, I think we were, the batter got, the flour went to the bottom where we got a little short of flour, and so that, that we didn't uh, really make much after about 2.30, but we were done at 4, so we pretty much covered the day pretty well. But I think overall it was a, a very good day, and I think that uh, 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 probably one of our best uh, uh, turnouts ever. Mm -hmm. Weather was beautiful, 45, 46 degrees, sun shining, a little light breeze. Uh, was perfect uh, for cooking down the sap and everything. and. And everybody, the you know, the blacksmith uh, Tracy was there, and Don was in the in the in the carpenter shop, and uh, and I think John and uh, Jim were doing most of the cooking down of mm -hmm. the of the sap, and so it went went over real well, and they have a very attentive audience, I think. Uh, you probably noticed it too. A lot of people stayed for a while and were really intent on yep. finding out what what was going on, what you were doing. So I think that was that was a, a good because this, this is a, it was well attended, but it's a smaller event than our other ones. We get a better chance to interact with the people uh, spring and fall than we do in the summer. We always tell people, I think, or we try to tell people, if you're going to come out and you want to talk about uh, the things or how things were done in more detail, uh, the spring and fall things are better for that because we have more time because we don't have 500 people there, so right. we can we can handle it better. So uh, uh, now we'll uh, go on to uh, see uh, Jim Nickel uh, doing some of the cooking down of the sap at the site. Uh, here we're making maple syrup, and we're doing it one of two uh, in two different methods. The method to uh, to my right back here is the way the Native Americans would have done it. They would have hollowed out a log. They would have put their sap inside. They would have built a fire, and in our fire there are some rocks. We'll take the rocks from the fire. We dip them in a bucket that has water in it to get the ashes off, and then it's put into the uh, maple sap in the log, and that will eventually cook it down. They would just keep moving the rocks back and forth to so always have hot rocks. Once the settlers came, that brought the metal pots so they could cook it off into a metal pot. And so it's just a matter of keep cooking it down and you just keep adding your sap, and as it cooks down, they would eventually end up with syrup, and they would test to make sure that they had syrup by taking a spoon, holding it up in the air, and letting it drip down. And once it started to string, it would be syrup. So at that time, then they could, because they didn't have filtering systems like we have now, they could have taken a wool shirt, poured it through a wool shirt to get out any impurities. Or they could let the uh, syrup set for two weeks, and then the impurities would settle to the bottom, and then they just had to pour it off and they could keep it. If they took their maple syrup and they kept boiling it longer, they would have got to a stage where it would have been very hot. It would be up to around 250 degrees. They would take a wooden spoon, take it off the fire, and they would stir that up, just like you do fudge, and it turns into a light, foamy color. And they would have poured that out onto a sheet, a metal sheet, and let it cool, and that would have been maple sugar for them. They, they would have been able, it would be hard, and it would be able to keep their sugar then for uh, as long as it would last. And that's how they had their sugar. They wanted to get away from the dependence of uh, the cane sugar that was being imported. And we've been cooking this down since about 10 o'clock, and we're probably about halfway there. We expect to get about a pint of uh, syrup for a day's worth of work out of this. But it will taste good, though. <laughs> And now we're going to be stepping into the Wakeley home. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of the two stoves in the Wakeley home. We have the cooking stove in the kitchen and, of course, the parlor stove in the parlor. So. I'd like welcome to my parlor. I'd like to introduce you to my parlor stove. This is a special stove here in, at Wakeley House. Parlor stoves were made for many, many purposes. This particular one has this ornate top on it. If you see the top, and the top comes off, you can actually put water inside of this, and then when it's put back on, 
the, the water will act as a humidifier into your room. What's actually happening here is the air that we have around us is coming to the stove. The stove is heating that, that particular air. It's going around inside all of these little curl, curly cues that you see in this ornate piece. And also in the front, you'll see a lot of ornate metal work done in this particular stove. It's circling it within all that metal work and the stove itself is doing its own job and it's shooting all of that hot air out into our, into our room. The room, as soon as you walk through the door, I think you could feel it just was radiating with heat. If you had a flat stove, like you're gonna see in some places, that heat does not radiate into the room. That heat will stay within the fire area itself. It'll go up the chimney and out into the air. So we're very, very fortunate here at uh, Point Bass to have my little parlor stove. And Mike's here, and he's gonna explain a little bit how they came about getting the parlor stove. The stove, uh, the kitchen stove, and the parlor stove were, were purchased. And there, we had two choices at the time. Uh, this was about uh, 14, 15 years ago. We could buy replicas, which might take a year to get them, or we could buy originals. These happened to be originals because the price was about the same. Actually, quite expensive. A parlor stove like this, somewhere between 1,200 and 2,000. Kitchen stove, between 2,500 and 4,000. Uh, fairly expensive. Replicas are about the same price, so it doesn't matter. Uh, this one was making, made in New York, and like Diane was talking, all this, as we would call it, maybe gobbledygook, had served a purpose, as she said. So uh, uh, this was purchased and, and brought here. And the parlor stove, besides heating, really doesn't have a function other than maybe you can put some water in there and, and get some humidity in the air. You can't cook on it, this sort of thing, but it, it's very functional. And as we know, standing in this room, we're warm because I think it's probably 10 or 12 degrees, 15 degrees warmer than the kitchen, which has a nice stove, but it doesn't heat as efficiently as this one does. Hi, my name is Mary, and I'm here at Point Bass. I do a lot of the cooking here. We use the wood stove for the cooking. This is a stove that is from 1867. It is not original to the house, but it is original to that era. This was the top of the line in the era because it had two uh, oven shelves. Instead of just putting everything into the oven and letting it cook, you had two shelves, so you had variety. It also has a warming area in the back, so you could warm up your, your water to do your cooking. It has four burners. Two in the front is for cooking, and two in the back are for warming. Also, a uh, feature of the, uh, the stove would be the shelf for our uh, irons. And you'd have multiple irons at the time, because once it got hot and you got to use it, once it started cooling off, you have another one to transfer, especially if you have extra children to help you. Again, just like they explained with the furnace in the other room, they have all the ornate areas of the stove to keep heat going through. This is, this is the only heat that be used in the house. They did not have a furnace. Um, you had to have the flat plate for the top for cooking, but this would keep the room clean. Uh, back in the studio again, uh, just to kind of a wrap up, uh, uh, the Tom Bramer with me, of course, and uh, and uh, for the future, we're we're doing uh, school groups this spring, uh, starting with April 24th with our first uh, school, and then we've got about five in May, and of course more are added as we get closer to the end of the school year. So anybody out there that has uh, uh, knows a teacher or has somebody in school, you know. Uh, kindergarten through probably fourth or fifth grade uh, would like to come out uh, just remind those people to contact us at our website and uh, we can handle that and, and schedule you scheduling you sooner is better than later because we get kind of booked up everybody wants to have these school groups at the end of the year also our, our festival is on a big event is June 13th and 14th uh, at the site uh, and uh, that's our big signature event and so we're gearing up for that we'll talk about that more in the next show and uh, of course next show will be led off with uh, Tom Bramer as Pierre Charette and his character in the in the trader's cabin so look forward to that thank you <laughs>